is here. Cinco. That is not me. blessed us with his presence in this place we will not be the same here can you hear all creation sings the heavens glorify his back from uh, Kenya, and if you talk to Chuck, just ask him how good the food is in Kenya. <laughs> Apparently they have a staple diet there, right, David? Staple diet, not just staples, but beans, rice, and a mash of corn, right? Every day, three meals, yeah. He said that was a little hard. Chuck is a little bit more of a gourmet than that. And he was a little disappointed with that, but uh, he made it through. I want to start with a text today that's a little bit peculiar, and if you'll, if you'll read through this text with me, you'll see where it goes funny on us. And this is in Mark chapter 14, verse 43. And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. Now, you remember what happened. Jesus has had the last... Uh, Passover feast and he's gone to the garden and he asked for his friends to pray with him a while and he would pray and they would sleep he would pray and they would sleep he would pray and they would sleep and finally it says immediately even as he said this as he was standing up 
Here comes Judas with a bunch of soldiers, and they had been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law, and the elders. And the traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. As soon as they arrived, Judas walked up to Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him, but none of the men with Jesus, but one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Now, it's interesting, in this particular book, it doesn't tell who was the guy with the sword, and the word in Greek is his ear lobe. It's much more specific than elsewhere, so keep going. Jesus asked them, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you have come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day. But these things are happening to fulfill what the scriptures say about me. Then all of his disciples deserted him and ran away. Is that clear? Everybody did that? Everybody? Anybody left? No. All of his disciples ran away. One young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. Now here's the question. What does the verse 51 and 52 add to what has already been said? Does it add any theological import? import? Nothing. Does it add anything about Jesus and his character and his behavior? Anything at all? Does it add anything about any character in this story whom we know what it is? No. So scholars for centuries have said that is a very peculiar text. Why would that text be in the Bible? And so they have surveyed and discussed and they have speculated and I am persuaded that the reason that that small sentence is there, that those two verses are there, is because they refer to the author of the book of Mark. Now, we get there by kind of a roundabout way. Mark's family, we know a little bit about. Mark's mother was Miriam or Mary, one of the Marys of the New Testament, one of the Marys of Jesus' uh, ministry is Mark's, John Mark's mother. And we know that John Mark's mother, Mary, lived in Jerusalem and she had a large house And we even know that it was probably at her house that Jesus ate the Last Supper. And we can see that in verse 12 of chapter 14. And it says, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them to Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, okay, where is he sending them? the city of Jerusalem, they're to walk into the city of Jerusalem, and he says, as you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you, follow him. Man carrying a pitcher of water means nothing to us, but to them it would have been very substantial because in all countries where you have to carry water, who carries the water? Women Women carry the water. Women draw and carry the water. In fact, in fact, in most of these countries, women wouldn't have it any other way. Because it is the women's time and opportunity to connect. When the women go to the well together, they draw their water, they experience community at the well. And a man would not have been welcomed there. A man would not have been appreciated there. They would not want a man in their midst. They want to go and be ladies together. That's why churches have women's ministries, to keep the men out. Let's be honest. It's an exclusion ministry, a ministry of exclusion. Men's ministry, we're always happy to have the girls along. No, okay, okay, that's an exclusion ministry too. So he says, as you see this man carrying the pitcher of water, at the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs, and I believe that he refers to the servant with the pitcher. He will take you upstairs to the large room that is already set up. That's where you should prepare our meal. This was probably Miriam's house. Most scholars agree that this was John Mark's mother's place. 
This place occurs, it crops up a couple more times in the New Testament. One time it crops up, the most prominent time is after Jesus is arrested. He's, I'm not Jesus, after Peter is arrested, everybody is in an upper room praying. Remember that? That's the upper room. They're in the same upper room praying for Peter and the angel comes and walks him out and leaves him in the narrow street, remember? And he walks to this place. He knocks on the gate. Rhoda, the servant, comes out and she hears his voice, thinks it's a ghost and runs away. Remember the story? So now we have identified a male servant who's drawing water and a female servant named Rhoda. So now we know that John Mark's mother, Mary, was a wealthy woman. She had a large house. We know that it had a gate and a courtyard, and we know that it had a large upper room. Many scholars believe that that's the same upper room in Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit came on the early church. So Mary's large house in Jerusalem was really the focal point of worship for the New Testament Christian church early on in Jerusalem. Imagine John Mark, how old would he be? The text said he was a young man, which means that he was over the age of 13 because he'd finished his bar mitzvah or he wouldn't be called a man, right? So he's somewhere between 13 and an age of an adultness or he would have called him a man. So we're thinking high school age, 13 to 16, 17. So here's this 13 to 16, 17 year old. Jesus and his disciples are having their dinner in his upper room and he's got to go to bed and he puts on his one piece linen garment and he crawls into bed and then he hears Jesus and his disciples going out. And he says, I want to know where they're going. So he sneaks out of bed in his linen garment and he follows them to Gethsemane. And here he is at Gethsemane and he's hiding in the bushes. Imagine for yourself, imagine if you could be there at Gethsemane with Jesus and the boys. He's hiding in the bushes and he's watching them and listening to them pray together. What a privilege. He's watching them, listening to them pray. And he knows that his mother absolutely believes that this is the Messiah. She's prepared dinner for him. She has made her place available for these, these gatherings. And here he is hiding in the woods, watching this prayer when up come the soldiers. And he sees Peter lop off somebody's earlobe. And he is scared. And a soldier grabs him and he decides it's better to be naked than to be arrested. And off he goes into the night. And I imagine for most of us, that would be a terrifying story that we would tell for the rest of our lives. And so many years later in Rome, Mark writes it down in his gospel. Now here's what's interesting. Would you describe that event as a success or as a failure? Tell me what you think Peter would have done if he could have had the spiritual maturity at the end of his life and they came to arrest Jesus. Do you think he'd have drawn a sword? Do you think he'd have cut off an earlobe? Or do you think he would have chosen to stay and stand with Jesus and go to trial with him? Yeah, me too. Me too. And I think if Mark had the spiritual maturity that he wished he'd had, he too would have gone to trial with Jesus. But he's a young kid and he's afraid. Have you ever been afraid? Have you ever wimped out? Have you ever felt that it's just not something that you want to do? You know, I believe that most alcohol and drug abuse is people who are just afraid and want to check out. We have a, a, an acceptable method for chemically checking out in this country. And when things get tough, people smoke pot. When things get tough, people drink alcohol. People emotionally and physically and chemically check out. 
And I believe that that's exactly what Mark felt he did. And I know that he did not feel pride from that decision. So time goes on. Here's Mark. And, and the question is, the question is, have you ever quit? Have you ever quit like Mark? I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember in gathering. Anybody remember in gathering? Okay, so the, the man's name was Farnsworth. He was a farm implement dealer up in Yankee Land somewhere. What's what, up north? Where was it? Anybody remember? It was up north in the, in the great, great Plains, and, and he sold. If, if anybody here has ever worked with farmers, you know that farmers don't get a monthly paycheck, right? So once or twice or three times a year, they get a large check, and they have to figure out how to make that last, right? So he sold farm implements. There's one or two times a year, specifically harvest time, that the farmers have enough money to buy farm implements. So the farm implement dealer likewise is on something of a schedule. And Farnsworth was a farm implement dealer. And every year at the harvest, all of his customers were rather flush with money. And so he decided to ask his customers, his friends, to donate a little something for his church at harvest time. That experience got institutionalized and it got called harvest ingathering. And it degenerated by the time of my childhood to walking up and down streets and knocking on doors and asking strangers for money. How that resembles Farnsworth is another question entirely, but that's how institutions work. And so the way we used to do it in my town is my mother was a fantastic soprano. She could be heard her clear voice for blocks and blocks. And so we would take a pickup truck. Now keep in mind, this is a 1960s pickup truck. We would take a beautiful 1960s pickup truck and we would put six metal folding chairs in the back and we would put my mother and five other singers and they would drive very slowly down the middle of the street in a neighborhood and two of us on either side would go from door to door knocking and asking for money. Now, there were guys Lonnie's age who were in a nice suit and they would go up to the door and people would give them money. And here I was, a 12 or 14 year old kid, and I would knock at the door and sometimes they would give me money. And at the end of the night, I would always have about half as much money as the Lonnie guys. And it used to really gripe me out because here's the math I did. Follow me, you know math isn't my thing, but this math I'm, I'm accurate on. Follow me on this math. If the doors that we knock at are randomly selected, and they were, and every door they knocked on, they got an average of X number of dollars, and every door I knocked on, I got an average of Y number of dollars, then we were leaving X minus Y at every door I knocked on. Right? Isn't that true? So I'm really discouraged. Because I feel like I'm not only not pulling my weight, I'm hurting the cause. Every door I knock on, I'm giving away X minus Y. And so I quit. Now, I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I'm not going to go back and re reanalyze that decision. But knocking on doors when you know that you're leaving money. I did the same thing when I worked calling for Olin Mills. Anybody ever get a call from Olin Mills? You young people, you don't even remember Olin Mills, do you? Olin Mills used to, back when people had telephones that were plugged in the wall, <laughs> Olin Mills was a photography shop. They were a, not a very good photography shop, but they were a very well marketed photography shop. And we would call every telephone number in the country every year and ask people if they wouldn't come have their portraits made at Olin Mills. And I noticed something after a very short time the sales records and the sales winners were always female voices. Male voices couldn't sell half as much as female voices, no matter what they said. So I quit that too. <laughs> so here's Mark. Mark is a quitter just like me. And he quits because he was afraid. This year, General, uh, what was his name? General, I'm sorry, Admiral William McRaven. I don't know what an admiral is, but it's something like a general. So Admiral McRaven spoke at the graduation at the University of Texas at Austin. 
I don't know, most of you probably read the article about it. He talked about lessons that he learned from going through SEAL training. Now, he said in SEAL tra team training that they have an experience of lots and lots of physical challenges. And every day they have lots of physical challenges. And if you fall short of a physical challenge, they would put your name on a list as having fallen short of a physical challenge. And at the end of the day, if your name was on the list, you got to participate in what was called a circus. A circus was more physical challenge. More physical challenge designed to either break your, your will or to break you down physically and make you quit. Well, he noticed that the same guys wound up on the circus list every time. These were the guys that were not able to keep up physically with the, the regimen. And they'd show up day after day, and day after day, they would go to the circus. He said everybody was afraid of getting called to the circus because it was torturous to go through more calisthenics, more exercise, more uh, fatigue. And it would hurt your performance the next day and became a perpetual cycle. And then he said he noticed something interesting, that after a while, the people who went to circuses a lot started getting stronger than those who didn't. The people who went to circuses began to become the physical leaders. And his message to the graduates was, don't fear the circus. Embrace the circus. Embrace the challenge because the challenge will bring you forward and make you stronger. Now here's the question. I don't know what Mark could have done. I don't know what Mark would have done. I don't know what Mark should have done when Jesus was arrested. But I know this. He cut and ran. Just like I've cut and run. The next time we see Mark is in the book of Acts. And book of Acts chapter 13, verse 13. It says, Paul and his companions left Paphos by ship to Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. Now, you remember what had happened they were ministering in Antioch, Antioch of Syria, and while they were in Antioch, a prophet got up in their midst and said, Jerusalem is going to be besieged by a famine. And the people of Antioch said, well, we need to send some aid down there. So they collected up their aid and they sent it by Paul and Barnabas down to Jerusalem. When Paul and Barnabas went, went down to Jerusalem, they visited with the brethren, they took them the aid, and when they came back, they brought Barnabas's cousin, John Mark, with them. After they were there a while, the Holy Spirit visited and said, Paul and Barnabas need to go on a missionary tour. They laid hands on them, they prayed them, uh, and they went off to the island of Cyprus. While they're there, they visit several towns, and at the end it says, there John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now that was no small thing. I was talking to was talking to Chuck, and he said, it's tough to stick by when there is nothing you want to eat. He said, by the end, the very smell of the food was just making his appetite completely go away. David, did you have that experience too? No, you loved it. Just eat anything, right? Chuck's a little bit of a gourmet, and Chuck was having trouble with the corn mash. And they don't call it corn, they call it maize, I think, but he, he had trouble with the corn mash. And he said, boy, a, a real good American meal would have gone a long way along those times. Now, we don't know why Mark left. We know that Mark did leave. And we know that when he left, he made Paul so angry that it broke up his friendship of many years with Barnabas. It was a serious infraction. Now, you know, there's a question of what happens when you break people's trust, not once, but twice. See, Mark abandoned God at Gethsemane and he abandoned Paul and Barnabas at Perga. Now here's the interesting question. Do you think that he could work his way back? It's an interesting story of the 2004, and uh, Phil helped me, it was in Athens. The 2004 Olympic team for rowing, eight person team from Australia. Anybody knows anything about Australia? Do you know how they like sports in Australia? That is a serious, serious sports country. Australia only has two major cities, Sydney and Melbourne. 
And the cities of Australia are so sports crazy. When I went and visited there, I met with our union secretary. He plays in leagues four days a week, and he's not unusual. They play lawn bowling, a game we don't even know about here. They use these strange oblong balls, and they throw them at one another. But not one another people, one another balls. And they, they play. In fact, they have three different professional rugby leagues in that country. Three different rules of games, three professional rugby leagues, not teams, leagues. And I thought, well, who do they play? They've only got two cities, Melbourne versus Sydney next week, Melbourne versus Sydney. Next week, Sydney versus Melbourne. Apparently not. It turns out that Melbourne, their second city, has 13, 13 rugby clubs from one of the leagues. And they have two more leagues. They play rugby seriously. They love their sports. They are serious about their sports in Australia. They talk about sports all the time. Sports is on the radio day and night. It's on the television day and night. And they even play cricket, which of course you know is a game that never ends. And they play cricket day and night. I saw cricket on the television all night long. It wasn't ESPN. Their regular channels show cricket all night long. When you go to Australia, you'll find you can't sleep at night for a while. So I watched a lot of cricket. So they have a rowing team in the 2004 Olympics, and there's this girl named Sally Robbins. And Sally Robbins is rowing, 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 and keep in mind, the Aussies are in the third place right now, and they could medal in this sport, and here she comes, the eighth member of the team, and she's pulling and pulling and pulling, and 400 meters from the end of the race, she just stopped, put her head down, rested, and they finished eighth place. The headlines read, just orful. Get it, oars. The headlines also read, it's eight, mate, pull your weight. I don't know if that's a headline or a comment, commentary. She really, really ruined her reputation with those people. Here's what she said afterwards. It'll be a long process, and I think I'll be back. I'll be back with these girls again eventually. She said, obviously, I have to earn their trust. <laughs> I'm not sure she'll ever get back with those girls. You know, in Australia, they're serious about their sport. When Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas, this was his second time. Have you ever known anybody that's been a two-time loser? You know, we love to tell stories of people who make a mistake and then come roaring back. What about people who make two mistakes? That's not as good a story, is it? You know, those stories are a little harder to find. A person who messes up twice and winds up leaving everybody else in the lurch, and that's exactly what Mark did. But let's look and see what happens. It turns out that our friend Mark did not end his ministry there. If we go to 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, Paul is writing to his friend Timothy, his disciple Timothy, and he says, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Do you think Paul would be an easy guy to work for? No. I mean, what he puts in his letter that he knows is going kind of public, little jabs like that, I'm thinking he's not a fun guy to work for. Damas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark when you come for he will be helpful in my ministry. Now who knows what happened in that intervening time, right? There was a time when Mark's mere presence was so offensive to Paul that he gave up his best friend. And now Paul is in prison in Rome and he's telling Timothy, bring me Mark. I need Mark. Mark can work with me. Something has changed. Let me tell you what we learned about Mark in those first two episodes. Episode one, Mark was there. That's all we can say that's good for him. He was there. He showed up. Episode two, he showed up. 
That's all we can say that's good. He abandoned after a while, but he showed up. And I want you to know there is a huge value to showing up. God calls us to show up. Now, I want to say God calls us to something a little more than showing up, but God calls us to show up. And I want to tell you that your hope is not gone as long as you can still show up. Here we are, and some of you may feel useless. I, have you ever felt like a third wheel or a fifth wheel? Which is it? I don't know. Have you ever felt like an extra wheel? I know I carry around a spare tire. That's not what I'm talking about. If you felt like you're just useless on a team, if you've ever worked on a team and you're just the guy who is not contributing, you've been there, haven't you? I mean, put me on the math team. I remember they invited me to be on the debate team, national debate team in law school. The problem with law school debate is that you have to write a paper first. And I'm a terrible paper writer. Terrible paper writer. So they invited me onto the team after the papers were written. Oh man, we killed them. We went to the nationals. We were great. It was fantastic. And the next year they came and said, okay, we want you to be on our team again. And I said, yeah, but this year we're going to have to write a paper. How would your team be if you had to write your paper one person short? Tough stuff. Have you ever been that guy on the team? The one that can't carry the weight? Apparently, Mark taught them by trust that he could carry the weight. And the question for us is, what does it mean to show up? The foremost researcher on relationships in America right now is this Dr. Um, God, what's his name? Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. Has anybody read any of Gottman's work? Gottman is a really interesting guy because he's a real scientist and a researcher. And what he did is he got an apartment in New York City and he fitted it out with tons and tons of microphones and cameras. So there were no secrets in the apartment. And then he got people to agree to go live their lives in the apartment under that kind of scrutiny. And so they would have to sign all their waivers and they would go live in the apartment. If they had a dog, they would take the dog. If they had, if they had children, they would take children. But they would go live in the apartment. And Gottman and his team of graduate students would go over, pour over every conversation, every argument, everything they did, and they would decide and analyze and take it, tear it down and build it up. And then they would also take all kinds of surveys from these people, and then they would follow them longitudinally. And you know what Gottman came to? He said that there are two kinds of relationships. There are the masters and the disasters. He says the masters and the disasters, one of the main things that divides masters from disasters is something he calls effectively using the bid process. Now here's what he means. His example is that the guy says, hey, honey, look, there's a cedar waxwing. Anybody know what a cedar waxwing is? Okay. They're, they're, they're birds. They eat little berries. They follow the berries. They go around the country, and they might only be in our area for two, three days, and then they're gone again. So he'd say, honey, I see a cedar waxwing. Now, what Gottman has deciphered is that he's not trying to tell his wife about a cedar waxwing. He's not expecting his wife to be the bird watcher he is. What he's doing is making a bid for her attention. And she can respond in one of two ways. She can say, hmm, that probably would be a rejection of the bid, right? Or she could say, another bird, right? A rejection of the bid. Or on the other hand, she could say, hey, another one, congratulations, put that in your book right? And that's an acceptance of his bid for attention. So we show up, but Gottman says showing up is half of it and engaging is the other half. Showing our attention and interest to one another is the other half. And here is John Mark. Somewhere between Perga and Rome, he convinced Paul and others that he was attentive to God's ministry and wanted to be part of the engaged ministry of Christ in the New Testament. Go to the next text and it says, 
Epaphras, this is Paul writing from Rome now. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and my co-workers. Mark doesn't even get listed among the co-workers. He's right up there at the top with Luke. In fact, he's above Luke. And it's not just Paul that was indebted to Mark. Peter says in 1 Peter, at the end of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 13, he says, your sister church here in Babylon, that's code for Rome, your sister church here in Babylon sends you greeting, and so does my son Mark. So here's the rest of the story. Most scholars believe that Mark wrote the book of Mark in Rome at the dictation and teaching of Peter. Most people claim that the book of Mark is really the gospel of Peter because it's his experience as told through Mark's pen and Mark's experience. So Mark was his secretary. Mark was Paul's secretary. Mark was the anchor secretary in Rome to the church. All because Mark showed up time after time and gave the people his service. Now the question is, what are we doing today? Are we just showing up? Are we running away? Are we the people who, when it gets tough, we stop coming? Are we the people who, when it gets difficult or uncomfortable, we just cut out of the conversation? Or are we the people who are willing, like Mark, to put it on and say, I have failed you in the past, but I will not fail you this time. I'm ready to be your scribe. I'm ready to be your secretary. I'm ready to take your dictation. And by so doing, he created, and most scholars believe, that not only was he influential in the church at Rome, but church tradition says that he started the church in, Ante in, in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. That after that, he went to Egypt and started the church. So Mark gives us an example of showing up and investing. And the question is, are we here? I believe, friends, I believe that God has already impressed you with the service that you should do. The problem is, sometimes we have a tendency to avoid the service for one reason or another, just like Mark did. And so today, what I'd like for us to pray about is I would like for us to pray that not only will we know our service, but that we will accept our service. That we will not flee when the times get tough. That we will not stay home when it's uncomfortable. You know, I can't say this enough. I believe that Christianity on many levels was designed to be uncomfortable. It was designed, you ask me, was it, was, is it supposed to be comfortable when we get down on our knees and wash each other's feet? No. That is an exercise in humility. That's discomfort. It's designed to be that way. Do you think it's supposed to be comfortable to take and eat bread and drink wine that's the body and blood of our Savior? It's not supposed to be comfortable. It's supposed to remind us of the importance of it. Do you think it's supposed to be comfortable to approach somebody else and tell them the life that you're living is gonna take you to hell and I want you to know the truth and the love of Jesus so that you can live forever? That's not supposed to be comfortable. Paul was not comfortable. Peter was not comfortable. Mark was not comfortable. These people were arrested, they were put in prison, and they were killed. It's not designed to be comfortable. So what I'm asking today is that you'll pray with me that we will be willing to be uncomfortable. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, first we thank you for your gift of life, eternity, and the Holy Spirit. Second, we thank you if you have already shown us clearly where our service lies, and if you have not, we beg and implore you that your Holy Spirit will educate, teach, inform, and, and grow us into maturity that we might be ready to serve. And third, we ask that you would give us the courage, the strength, the perseverance and the fortitude that even though we have failed so many times in the past, that you will transform us today and begin us on a road to unending, unstoppable service. 
Make our hearts willing. Make our hearts courageous. And give us a future that will be a blessing to your kingdom. Let us dent the doors of hell. Let us overpower the evil one through your spirit. And let us bring others into our loving family and help us to be transformed into the image of Jesus. We ask it in his holy name. Amen.